-hmm. It can be frustrating. It can be difficult. I love that you could express anything you wanted in lettering and huge things to then do an absolutely tiny thing. Probably the big one that I became known for was Golden Globes. Hi everyone, welcome back to Calligraphy Masters podcast. We are back with another episode and today's guest is someone super special. As always, all my guests are super special, at least to me. Uh, I try to have people who inspire me and uh, today's person is such one. His work is amazing. He does a lot of cool things. Uh, you see if you haven't seen already. So welcome to the podcast, Rob Draper. Hey mate, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Yeah, I'm super uh, hyped to have you on the podcast because, as I just said, uh, I love your work. Uh, you do something amazing and uh, you've combined some things that uh, I don't think many people are doing something similar to what you do. And uh, your work is really, really recognizable. I mean, whenever I see something on Instagram, I, I know it's your work and I think this is something that a lot of people strive for, but not everybody is at this point. And yeah, today we'll talk about your journey. Uh, I think your journey is more about lettering, not calligraphy, right? Yeah, it's a bit of, uh, yeah, it's almost a bit of a weird bit of everything, to be honest. Okay, okay. So I started the podcast with uh, asking people to tell me how old are they, where they're from and, uh, how their childhood or life went to come to the point that uh, they met with calligraphy or lettering and how everything started. Okay, so so my name is Rob, obviously, and um, I'm from Worcester, um, which is in the Midlands in the UK. Um, okay. Pretty much the only thing I say when people recognize it is that where you make the sauce, and that's right where you make Worcestershire sauce. So I'm from there. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love Worcester sauce. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Look, no matter where I go, Worcestershire sauce, people know it. Yes. And um, and I'm now 48, 48 years old. Um, I started when I was young. I was at school. I absolutely loved art and was really, really, really keen on art. But art at school wasn't particularly interesting. It wasn't particularly motivating. Um, and then when I was probably maybe nine, 10 years old, this thing landed from America, which was um, hip hop, and you had graffiti, rap music, break dancing. And I was completely, completely taken by, by graffiti because it meant for the first time that art could be cool. It gave me adventures. It gave me, um, it gave me a social life. It gave me an identity, a confidence. And, um, and I absolutely loved it. And I had lots and lots and lots of adventures within that for years and years. Um, then I left school and went to art college, did three years at art college and then three years at university um, in art and design, graphic design, and then visual communication. Okay. Um, and then I left there and I pretty much did every job you can imagine in the industry from junior designer to designer, graphic designer, magazine designer, um, creative director. And the last role I found myself in was um, I was art director of a fashion brand. And we got asked, uh, I, I, well, first of all, I loved it there. I completely loved it. I, I thought I'd finally found my perfect job. It, it allowed me to do a lot of painting a lot of lettering, but a lot of conventional kind of digital work as well. And then one day we were told we were bought out. We've we'd been bought by a bigger company and the entire company was moving to the other end of the country. So I was completely, completely devastated at the time. Didn't know what to do. I couldn't relocate because I had a life in Worcestershire where I was. And um, and so I was made redundant. I had absolutely no idea what to do at all. Um, I then thought, well, I won't turn down anything at all. I'll just turn, you know, I, I've had no idea what to do, but I'll just take things on and I won't turn down anything. So I was doing everything from, um, I went off briefly and did some, uh, did some sessions with a canal barge painter to learn kind of traditional tools and techniques. Is this something like sign painting? It's exactly like sign painting, yeah, I went and tried some of that. Um, 
I went to try and start a clothing company. I was going to try and start a clothing company. And the idea was going to be that you'd see the designs and you'd like them. And then you'd go to the website and you'd sort of from there, you'd think to yourself, well, I want to employ him to do stuff for me. Uh, so I tried to get that on the go as well. I started to get asked to teach as well. So I teach art, I teach uh, graphic design. I was doing creative creativity sessions to everyone from special needs children to children to adult students and doing some sessions in men's prison as well. Oh. And, um, and then in the background, one day I was, I, I used to, I, it was around the same time as I'd sort of been introduced to Instagram and I'm not really a big, well, I wasn't really a big social media user at all. But I thought, well, if I start putting work onto Instagram, people will see it and it will be like, almost like a shop window. Like you'll see the work and you'll think to yourself, okay, I'm gonna investigate that a bit more and I'll go and look at his website and try and do some work with him. So that was the big plan. And one day I didn't have my sketchbook with me and I drew on a disposable coffee cup, put it online and I fell into this really, really great loop of I got really good feedback and at the time I really didn't know what I was doing and I was trying to do sort of 10 different things at once trying to make one of them work and I got this really good feedback so I was like well okay well I'll go back and I'll do it again so I did it again and I tried to spend a bit longer on it and that how, old, how old were you at this point uh, this is about this is probably about six years ago now maybe six years ago now so um, you, you basically started like more serious with lettering uh, around it. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So I, I sort of um, it was things I was doing in the in, in my spare time anyway. I was always mm -hmm. drawing. I've always drawn. I've always um, if I'm if I'm sort of you know if I'm talking on the phone, I'm always drawing. I always have done all my life drawing, and um, it was just like okay, maybe I can now make this work for me. Um, I felt certainly when I got made redundant, I felt like I was um, I was too old to retrain. I didn't. I felt like graphic design was kind of a young man's game now. So I was kind of like I just didn't know what to do. So so I was just drawing these designs and thinking, well, maybe something will happen. Maybe something will happen. Maybe there's something will happen, and completely not knowing what. And I said the the big thing for me at the time was setting up this clothing company. I was going to set up this clothing company, and it was and it was going to be this really really good idea that it would generate work for me. And then one day I was doing sessions in a men's prison, and um, I left there. And as part of obviously working in there, you're not allowed phones or you're not allowed laptops or any form of communication with the outside world. And I left there and I turned on my phone, and my phone is kind of vibrating itself to pieces. I've got text, mail, text messages and voicemails. And the first message I get is my mom reading the Daily Mail and there's an article on her son drawing on these coffee cups on the homepage of the Daily Mail. Huh. And, and it just blew up from there. From there. It, it went around the world a couple of times. It completely, completely blew up. Um, the clothing company didn't need to happen because the coffee cup thing had become what the clothing company was meant to be. And okay. it just, it, it, it turned into being this great sort of, um, this great way of generating work and generating exposure as a result of that. And like in our days, like your work is mostly based on lettering and sign painting, and at least from what I see. And uh, besides uh, the arts college and all that stuff, have you ever done any specific uh, workshops or teaching of uh, lettering and uh, no, not really. No, no, not really. And I, I don't think um, I do get asked to do it quite a lot, but I always find that I haven't got um, to do what I do. There isn't a really clear formal route to do it, if that makes sense. There's not mm -hmm. a real clear pattern of, what, of ways to do it. I mean, there are there are ways you can apply gold leaf. There are ways you can uh, apply letter and everything, but there's no real clear route to that what I try and tend to do in the in the times that I have worked with students and, and talked about it is say just draw and draw and draw and draw and draw and try and find your voice through that drawing and kind of develop that and develop that and that there's no real there's no real clear way for me to find your voice if that makes sense yeah well you use a lot of gold leaf and I mean you also work on a lot of mediums like you do work on bottle, on bottles, on uh, car. What's it called? I don't know how it's called. This uh, uh, bonnets. Yeah. Car bonnets. I mean, you do work on all these different mediums. Like, what push you 
pushes you to do work on such mediums and from all that mediums is there something that you enjoy the most no I, it started as um the the whole idea of the coffee cups again is the whole idea of contrast i think contrast is a really good thing to find in your work whatever you're doing however you're working contrast works and the whole contrast of finding the most throwaway thing you can find possible and spending as long as you can drawing on it or the or the contrast of finding something a cheap as you possibly can find and then applying dog leaf to it and I think contrast really really works and I just try and sort of play within that really um try and find unusual things things that haven't necessarily been drawn upon before and then I just find I get completely engrossed in the challenge of drawing on them your I think like uh, lettering usually takes more time than calligraphy like how much time do you spend on a daily basis like doing works and do you do only works that you show or you also do stuff that you don't show to um yeah somewhere in between so there's kind of there's there's two bits to what I do almost I can I work as almost a commercial artist and designer so I work for brands and agencies and people like that so so there's more that's more sort of clearly advertising something um but apart from that the personal work I do There is, yeah, probably there's a lot of work I don't show. There's a lot of work that for some reason I, I, what happens is I'll do something and then I'll go back and do it again and I'll be more pleased with the second time. So the first time will never get seen. Um, but I constantly, yeah, I work as much as I possibly can because I just enjoy it. I can get lost in it. I can find, I can, I can, I really enjoy experimenting. I enjoy experimenting. I enjoy doing huge things to then doing absolutely tiny things. I enjoy the contrast of that. I enjoy, I could spend two days doing a piece of lettering sort of this big and then really, really enjoy doing 30 pieces in an hour the day after, which are really, really quick. And, you know, it, it just, I, 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 I really enjoy playing with that. Did you have like love for letters throw all your life or it's something that started developing when you start uh, no, with no, the, the graffiti? It, it can, No, I think um, I think at the start, graffiti kind of taught me that you could play with letter forms. And one of my earliest books I remember reading was Subway Art, which pretty much it was the this sort of graffiti bible. And looking at Subway Art and looking at people, there were artists like Blade in there who would sort of um, who would develop these almost like conceptual pieces. And I loved that you could express anything you wanted in lettering. And When I was, when it came to leaving school and going to college, it was a real clear decision for me whether, whether to go towards graphic design or whether to go towards art. And I wanted to go more towards art, but art didn't feel like it was a good career move. People didn't really seem to get paid where I was as artists. It was, it was more about sort of who you knew rather than what you knew. So graphic design was a natural sort of, um, a natural route for me because it meant I was already used to working within letters and working within letter forms. So I went off towards graphic design and in the mid nineties, um, there were people like designers like David Carson, Scott Clune, people like that who would, um, Tomato was a, a big ag agency in the UK who really, really shifted what I felt about lettering and what I felt about graphic design they were almost using graphic design as, as almost like an art form so so that to me was really really inspiring it taught me to think differently about the work I was doing at the time and and that even within dig digital work you could create artwork even within sort of conventional layout work you could create art how did I mean your work is stunning like your your, your letters are always super beautiful is it all from what you've studied in the college and at art school yes, or? It, it, it literally is just through practice and practice and practice of just doing it again and again and again and again. Um, and as I said, I, it's always been, even when I was working within, um, within companies and within agencies all my life, it was something that I've always done outside of work as well. So I, I, I find I, I really enjoy it as a, as a sort of pastime anyway. So I, it was just a case of It just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and, and, and trying to enjoy that journey as well. Um, and there is, you know, when, I, when you look back, there are, you know, if I did the same piece now that I did five years ago, you know, I'd be embarrassed of that piece five years ago. But <laughs> you, you sort of, you don't realize at the time, but you, 
you can clearly look back and see that certain areas are more developed than others. It sounds like you're uh, self-taught in lettering, right? <laughs> Self-taught, although as I said, I, I did go through um, I did go through art college and university, so, so sort of semi-self-taught, yeah. Okay, but uh, are there any books or sources like uh, people that were inspiring you and that you're looking up to in that period? Uh, certainly, as I said, designer-wise, David Carson was a big one. Um, David Carson was a huge influence. Um, Tomato, the agency, was a Again, a big influence. Uh, Designers Republic were a big um, graphic design company in the UK. That they, they were a huge influence. Um, Tinker Hatfield from Nike um, again was a huge influence in learning what you can do and how you can experiment within your sort of field. Um, other artists as well. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by Roy Lichtenstein. I, I remember going as to gallery visits at art college and going and looking at Roy Lichtenstein's work and really, really enjoying the kind of real clear, clean, bold lines. But Jackson Pollock as well, I, I, you know, I'm fascinated by Jackson Pollock's work. I'm fascinated by that kind of immediacy of it and the kind of mess and expression of it. So, so just, I think, as I, as I mentioned before, what happens is you become this kind of, um, you become this like sort of mixing pot of throwing in a bit of this in and a bit of that in and a bit of that in and, and then you're trying to trying to find your own identity and trying to sort of play within that you use a lot of gold leaf like is there something like do you have some special love for gold or <laughs> like at what point did you like as i'm not sure if it's if you did it through your time but uh when you scroll your feed there there is Quite a lot of uh, gold leaf work. Yeah, absolutely. Involved. And I think what happened was um, at the when to, when I when I first got made redundant, and I was thinking of things that I could do, and I was thinking of uh, different ways. And I got employed to do a couple of jobs that were sort of like traditional sign writing jobs. And um, I was at that point, I was very much self taught. I'd, I'd sort of found my way into it. I didn't really know what the tools were or the techniques. So. I thought to myself, well, if that's the sort of work I'm going to get, and if that's the route I'm going to go down, then I'll go and find out the best way of doing it and find out if there's ways, the best materials, the best tools and the best techniques. So I went off and did a course with a traditional sign writer who would paint canal barges. And during that time, they showed me, um, they showed me sort of painting and conventional painting and how to use paints and how to, which paints to use and which brushes to use. And then on one of the sessions, they, they were like, and this is how to use gold leaf. And I remember thinking it's, it has this kind of wow factor to it. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, wow, that's really, really interesting. And it wasn't until probably maybe 12 months later when I completely forgot about it, but it was in, in the right in the back of my mind that I could, maybe I could use that for something. Maybe I could use that for something. And then I bought some and it was, again, it was that idea of just trying to find contrast, trying to, I think that's one of the things with creating work and certainly creating work that you put on social media is you, you're sort of always trying to keep a thread that runs through you so people know it's you and people know it's your work. But you have to go through this thing of sort of reinventing yourself and challenging yourself and trying to sort of um, trying to re, reinvigorate yourself almost. And I thought, well, maybe the goal leap will work, you know, and, and again, finding the cheapest, I can't remember what the first thing I did was, maybe it was a paper plate or something like that, but just finding something really, really cheap or finding something really, really disposable and then thinking, right, what's the biggest amount of contrast I can put into that object? And the biggest amount of contrast is of course, gold leaf in it. And and just, and I ended up enjoying it and it, it became something else that's become kind of attached to me that becomes one of, the, one of your go-to things that you can go back to. Do you do everything alone by yourself? Like, do you shoot and edit your videos and everything? Or you have some people that you work with that you help? With? What happened was I got to a stage where all my Instagram account was just still images, still images. And um, and at the time, my son decided, uh, my son really, what, I was getting to a stage where I was like, well, I need to push this further. I need to push this further. And my son was really, really interested in being a YouTuber because, of course, YouTubers make millions of pounds and <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So I was, uh, I, I, he sort of wanted to get into that. And so I was like, well, I need to learn how to help him do that. So I got a camera and I, I'd never used editing software before or anything like that. But I was kind of like, well, OK, let's try this and let's try this. 
so we went out and we I, I said got a camera and got a phone and was recording all these clips and um he immediately lost interest in it but i found that i could now use editing software and could now use a camera so i was like well okay well maybe i can um maybe i can bring that into my social feeds and maybe i can start creating work and video in it so that was how that first started and again over time i've been able to hopefully sort of go back into that and refine that. I've got better equipment now than I certainly had at the start. I realized that if you look at the first, maybe, I don't know, maybe the first 12 months of me shooting video, that it was quite skittish because the paper kept moving. So I was kind of like almost, I need to retrain so I can draw horizontals and verticals without moving the paper. Because naturally you sort of tend to, I tend to move the paper to draw a vertical line and move the paper to do a horizontal line. So. I was kind of like, well, I need to, again, I need to learn how to, how to do this, but without moving the paper, because it, it, on a time lapse, it just, you can't see what's going on. So just again, sort of teaching myself to try and do that. And, and it's, I've used videographers. I've got some really good friends who are videographers who do little projects with me and everything, but I find it's, mo it, it's the absolute easiest to do it on my own um, because I, I can just jump on it there and there. But I mean, your your like uh, your videos, they're like edited very well. Like uh, I mean, there are so many artists on Instagram, and not everyone has such a good editing. And I think uh, editing and presenting the video itself it, it makes a huge difference for uh, for people. I think it's just I think again, it's like it's like I said about the letter at the start. I think whatever you do, if you keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it, you try and better that every time and you you think to yourself well that didn't necessarily you know as i said before it didn't it doesn't necessarily work if you keep moving the work because as you know i'm trying to again maybe at the start i was doing sort of maybe 45 seconds and then i've tried to sort of refine that and refine that so now i'm at about 15 20 seconds generally speaking the work i do and it was kind of like well how how can i make that as good as possible and and, and again it was things like actually don't move the surface of what you're drawing on try and keep that still so how do you then again retrain yourself to draw lines in certain ways um but it is just a, it really is just a case of just trying to keep go back into it and go back into it and try and make it the best thing you can do because for me it's certainly certainly early in my earlier in my career of doing this um I knew how important it was. I knew that there was the work I was going to get, the, if I wanted to work for, for people on the other side of the world, I was gonna have to do this bit as good as I possibly could because there's so much stuff out there and it's kind of how can you, how can you look your best in that? I didn't, again, I didn't have budget. I didn't have any money for kind of advertising myself or anything. So this was all I've got. So I need to make this as good as possible. Otherwise I need to go and get a job. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned that like uh, probably you were going for graphic design because you know with art how you make money but I mean I, I guess you consider yourself as an artist right? I do now I think what certainly what happened again um, and certainly in the last two years because um, Covid came along as we all know and, and, and probably a good chunk of my a good chunk of my work just sort of vanished overnight. Things I was booked on, things that were definitely happening sort of vanished. And I was and I was thinking to myself, well, how do I get around this? And then you just, I just created more and more per personal work. And then so the more personal work is more probably artistic than it is design. And um, there's always within, within working for companies, there's always this strange sliding scale of, of some of them want you to be sort of 90% artist and 10% designer. Some of them want you to be 90% designer, 10% artist. And you just, depends who it is, you just work within that. At what point you start having clients? Because, uh, you know, I mean, as an artist first is not like the easiest job to make a living out of it. And second of all, artists which uh, present their art in the form of letters, I guess it's even a bit harder. So. Yeah, it's, it is always difficult because I think I think the issue with certainly with lettering artists and is what you actually say. 
if that makes sense. You know, it's kind of, uh, you're trying to, if you're trying to get a, a, an agency or a brand to kind of look at your work that, you know, you can't, certainly at the start, you've got to think about the messages you say and without, you know, you don't want to make everything look too sort of, too bland and too boring, but at the same point in time, too confrontational, too aggressive isn't necessarily going to going to work either. So it's a, it really is at the start. It's a real clear challenge of, of, of firstly finding a style to work within, finding a lettering style, and then secondly, what do you actually write? Um, and certainly ju uh, during COVID and during the first wave of COVID, I really struggled with that because. I sort of didn't feel any more, um, you don't know what to write. There was no point in writing something that was really positive because everybody was like, this is happening. The world's, you know, falling to pieces. This is, a, this is an absolute nightmare. And you can't write that everything's really bad because of course there's people who've got it far worse than you. So you sort of, you end up being in this really strange situation of not knowing what to write. And so, you, you know, for me, Instagram Reels was a really, really good thing because it meant that some of the music, music I was listening to, I could then actually put onto my videos. Because certainly at the, at the start, because before Instagram Reels existed, I, I, was, I got issues with copyrighted music. So yeah. then I had to learn GarageBand on the iPad to make my own music so it wouldn't get copyrighted. So that was something else I had to do. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so up into a certain up into a certain point, all the all the tracks on my videos I'd done myself using GarageBand because I was kind of like, well, at least then I it can't get struck up for copyright. Um, and so and and so when Instagram Reels came along, it was it was really great because it meant that these tracks I was listening to, I could actually put them onto put them onto this, they've got a loose kind of theme of, of the work I was doing. What kind of clients do you get like the most and are they usually reaching out to you or do you have some some brands or people that you want to work with and sometime you reach out to them? Generally speaking, this is a, this is a real sort of, um, it's a difficult lesson that somebody told me quite early on that, that, that they have to come to you. Um, generally speaking, they, the agencies that I think they they like to find you if that makes sense mm -hmm. um and certainly in the early days I, I you know I was sending out emails to people saying you know can I do this for you can I do that for you can you come and look at my portfolio can you come and look at this and um I'm fairly sure that I don't think I've got a single response from any of them at all um completely completely nothing so I just thought well I'll just carry on and I'll carry on and I'll do my work and hopefully that will be enough um, and fortunately it has been, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's an incredibly difficult industry to, to be a part of. And, and, and yeah, I've, I think finding the person, finding the right person in a company who you want to work for is one thing. That person then having a project that suits your work at that particular time is a complete, complete other. So my sort of uh, my approach has just been to create work, create work, create work I love, create work I enjoy doing, and hopefully um, the planets align and they see that work and they decide that they want to use me for something. So do, do you get all your clients from Instagram or you promote your work somewhere uh, No, I've got, uh, I work with an agent now, so I've got an agent who represents me. Um, okay. Um, and it, but hopefully it, it just, it works in the same way as before. So you, you would see my work, you would find my work somehow on social media. Um, and then you'd have a look at my website and you'd sort of um, see the type of work I do, the type of work, I, the type of client work I do. And then you kind of contact me through there. So how does this exactly work working with an agency? And what is the difference between working on your, alone on yourself and then working with an agency? So it just, I, I suppose the, the, the most basic way is it means that all the, um, the client would supply them the brief, they would work out the, uh, the financial side of it and everything. And but with it, they would speak to you and they would find out from you how long it would take you or how long, that, how long the project would take. And then they deal with all the money side of it. So what happens is that it's all sorted when the project gets to you. So, so it, theoretically, what it means is that you just get to do the creative stuff. You work with a lot of big brands now, right? Yes, yeah. Like, uh, do you have three 
top three favorite projects that you worked for some brands or no i couldn't say that would be unfair <laughs> no. what, why is that <laughs> no i just you know, i wouldn't want to offend any of them um no they, they uh, to be fair they've all by and large they've all been they've all been great they've all been um no i don't mean I don't mean in a, in a that way, like experience with them, but just the project itself that you enjoyed the most or something like this. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the projects working with Nike was absolutely great. You know, Nike I was desperate to work for as a, as a child, obviously through the, through the kind of break dancing and graffiti and, and uh, you know, American culture. So, so Nike was an absolutely great one for me. Um, probably the big one that I became known for was Golden Globes, because it just, it, it was, in, it's incredibly surreal to go from um, to go from redundancy and to go from you know what you've what felt like sort of failure to 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 then just put in these pieces of work online that you didn't feel um, you had no idea if anyone was seeing them or if they were going anywhere to then working for Hollywood was just yeah crazy. I can't even imagine like working on such project like it just it's just crazy just literally it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, it's brilliant, terrifying, and it's uh, yeah. It's 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 um, the greatest thing that happened along the way, which was really really nice, was um, because you're doing so much personal work that when the client does come along, they as a mood board at the start, they reference your personal work. So it's it's really great. It, it's it's um, you know, generally speaking, it, it it's just it's a real, it's really great because it means that, you know, some of these, some of these projects, you can remember when you were doing them and you can remember thinking, I don't know if this works, I don't know if I like this, I don't know if I, and, and then seeing it as, as a client's reference point to start a project with them is, is yeah, it's, it's great. And isn't it so stressful if you're going to reach their expectations or something like this? I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is, but, um, but I'd always... As I, as I mentioned before, I'd always worked within graphic design. I'd worked within, so I, I'd sort of got used to working with clients and working with agencies and working with brands and producing work for them. So it is because it means that it's, it, as an individual, it's on your shoulders rather than being as part of the company. But there's always been that pressure to, there's always been a, there's always been a deadline. There's always been a budget. There's always been, you know, some sort of, um, some sort of uh, you know issues about how you created that work okay your background and what you've done like somehow uh wait uh, i i guess it helps you to work Completely, on such yeah. projects but mm -hmm. i can you give some advice or tips to people that are just that don't have the same background like some stuff that can help them in such uh, yeah i think I I think without any shadow of doubt, I would just create and create and create. And that would be my advice because I think it's, it's never, um, it's never a wasted thing to do because you, you, as I mentioned before, if, if it is commercial work you want, then you're almost training yourself to be able to do uh, commercial work as well. You know, when I look back and I see certain things I've done, I've got better at doing them through doing them behind the scenes when there was no client work on. So I think it's just a case of just generating work, generating work, generating work, trying to find what your voice is. Um, I try not to be, I, I hope I'm not too influenced by other people. I try and sort of stay within my lane. I try and do my own thing. I try and constantly try and reinvent myself, but at the same point in time, staying within the things I know. So, you know, again, if I, if I work really small on a lot of things and I'm like, well, how can I take that bigger? How can I make that bigger? How can I make that bigger? Or how can I make that more detailed? Or how can I make that quicker? Or even simple things like, because I was doing a lot of black and white work, how can I bring color into that? How can I bring um, gold leaf into that? How can I bring glitter into that? How can I, how can I, you know, just thinking about what you do and trying to sort of push that and push that and push that and take it as much, take it as far as you can. And I think, that's a really good thing. I always, even when I was working for clients and even, even when I was working within agencies and they wanted, they said they wanted work a certain way, I would still try and, if I was going back to them with two or three different options at the start, 
I'd always go back to them with one that was really, really creative and uh, kind of hope that they would choose that one and I, and I could go on, on that route with them. And they often do. So I think it's, it's just a case of just creating work and creating work and, and trying to see where that takes you and trying to enjoy the journey as, of doing that as well. What's the biggest issues or struggles that you had uh, on, on the way of your journey? probably a lot of stuff up here a lot of things about actually what do i you know what do i do um i felt quite isolated um during this journey i felt quite isolated certainly when i lost my job um i then went through a complete roller coaster of life which is a complete other story but 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 thinking being a freelancer is quite an isolating experience you spend a lot of hours on your own a lot a lot of hours on your own and I thought to myself at the time, I was like, I, I, you're spending hours and hours, you know, you should be out trying to earn money, but you're spending hours and hours and hours drawing on kitchen roll and putting tea and, and coffee cups and you, and you, and you know, and, it, and it's okay now talking about this now and thinking, okay, maybe it sort of worked and it's great. But at the time when you're thinking, you know, I've got bills to pay, and I'm, you know, drawing on crisp packets. It's, um, yeah, it's quite, it can be quite difficult. But what makes you keep moving? Like if you're in a such position, like you have bills to pay and you don't know what to do, what uh, pushes you to, to keep? Uh... Because you, because I think you, it, fa- it just feels like something you should do. It feels like you something you should do. I, it was, uh, say for me, I didn't, I, I didn't know what else to do. I, I had no idea what else to do. I, I, I mentioned before, I, I didn't know, I, I didn't, I felt too old to retrain. I felt like graphic design was now a young person's job and a, it was a much more automated graphic design than ever was before. It was a lot more software led. And um, and so I, was, I, I just genuinely didn't know what to do. And then what happens is it it wasn't all worked out, which is the other thing as well. It's um it wasn't this clear plan of like this clear 10 step plan to get where I am today. It was more a case of I don't know what to do, but I know that if I keep doing things that will increase the chances of something happening and it will increase opportunity rather than sitting and doing nothing and, and waiting which I knew wasn't going to work. And from, from all the projects you've done with uh, brands or clients, which is the most challenging one and why? Um, the most challenging one? Probably the Golden Globes, because there was such a um, huge amount of expectation I put on myself. Um, and certainly at the start, uh, in the first year or two, um, I was going through I was going through a lot of uh, I didn't have an office I didn't have a studio space so I'd be sort of sat in a library drawing it drawing this work and then I remember very 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 clearly that the first time um, the first year I did it um, I didn't have an office a studio space I was a uh, long long story but I was living at my sister's as well so the the challenge was simply getting the files there in time, getting big files across to America in time. And I remember my laptop was pushed up against the, the router at my mom's house to try and get these files across there in time. And it was broadcast um, live the night after. So yeah, that was a real, um, that was a real, real challenge. I see. Okay. Uh, you have two projects on your feet, which I uh, like, first one is the Rolls, Rolls Royce one. Were they your client or you just... No, 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 not at all. Not at all. I, again, um, I did a... Um, two and a half years ago, about two and a half years ago, I did a, a, an interior design job um, for a co-working space. And the co-working space was formerly um, a police station. It was, a, it, was a, it was an old police station and it's now been converted into a co-working space. And I got the... I got the contract to do an interior design job. So that was everything in there from the, the, the flooring to the seating, to the painting the walls, to the lighting, everything. And I thought to myself at the time, we wanted to put character into the place and it had these big old fireplaces in there. And I thought, well, if you put in the same way as like an old place would have antlers on the wall, like mounted um, moose heads with antlers, I was kind of like, well, a car bonnet sort of roughly forms that same sort of shape. 
And because it was an old police station, I went and created these car bonnets that were, that were old police car bonnets and put those on there. And it went really, really well. And, um, and people have asked me about them a lot ever since. And I, again, I thought about it and thought about it and thought, well, what's the contrast? What's the most, you know, the most iconic um, car bonnet I can find? And that was Rolls Royce. So I started doing those. I've done a couple of those. A couple of those have sold it's just as art pieces. And, really? and yeah, it's just become this, again, real, real challenge. I've got some Range Rover ones now. And, and yeah, they people seem to like them and I love doing them. Yeah, and uh, the other one is the police one. Is this original or again? <laughs> no, it's... Uh... <laughs> I, I was super, like, confused when I saw the police one. Yeah, well, that's... Yeah, that, that, that's how that started. Yeah, that's how all that... All the police ones started was by working in a... in an old police station and... and trying to bring as much character into that police station as possible. But are you allowed to write on uh, such... Uh that says police i mean i don't know we'll see <laughs> <laughs> all right do you have interest in nfts what do you think about them i didn't know i i um I, i don't know enough about them for me to get involved in them if that makes sense i certainly missed that first wave of them where people you know i, I remember seeing it during lockdown where people were getting like you know life-changing sums of money um i didn't know enough about it i um a few of the people I spoke to were that they weren't necessarily um, all it seemed and that it wasn't necessarily all good. So I just sort of sat it out and waited. And um, and at some point, if the right person comes and talks to me, um, then, then perhaps that will be something that happens. But at the moment, it hasn't, um, because I don't know enough about the technical, the, the sort of the technical stuff that goes on behind that. And... Um, Fortunately, I've not I've not had to go towards that at the moment. Okay, they seem quite controversial. Well, the, like, there's a thing. A lot of people they like don't know what exactly it is, and at the same time, a lot of people use it for other purposes, and it is. But I I think it's a a very good opportunity for a, a lot of artists. It is, like, as I say, if, if if the right person comes along, um, then you know who knows who knows. But at the at, At this point, that hasn't happened, and fortunately, I haven't needed it to. So, are there a lot of people who are asking you, like, how to become like you? Yeah, I, I do get a few. Yeah, I do get a few requests, but it, it, as I say, it's quite difficult because I don't, I don't. It doesn't follow a particular pattern of anything. If anything, it's just a lot of a gigantic amount of failure and some things that work and some things that you know some things that don't and just putting those down and putting those down and putting those down and and hopefully they they connect with somebody um somewhere else but it's not um there isn't there doesn't feel like there's a formal way of doing it i mean i can i can explain how to draw on kitchen towel but at the same point in time the best way of drawing on kitchen towel is to just try it and 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 and you'll get better at it over time. I mean, you work on so many different things, like bottles of perfume, champagne mm. bottles, like, isn't it hard? Like all these different surfaces, like, yeah, isn't well, it challenging? Is, it, yeah, that's and that's pretty much what I mean about how it's really difficult to sort of teach it because there isn't a clear route in the same way. Um, what you would use to draw on a perfume bottle is completely, completely different to what you would use on a car bonnet, which is completely different to what you would use on a coffee cup. So it just, what happens is you, you, um, you get to a stage where you've got so much now art material that one of them will work somehow. One of them will work and you just, you just get it and you experiment with it and you think, well, that works or that, you know, that, that can transmit the message I want in the best possible way. But it's just it's just a constant case of experimenting. Some brands paints work really well. Some brands paints work terrible on certain things. I mean, I, I guess this excludes my next question. If you have any specific tools and materials that you prefer working with, but no, I, literally anything. I mean, anything at all. Anything at all. At the, certainly at the start, I would use um, I would I use Faber Castell pens, uh, pit pens, because I found that you could get five or six different widths of those pens and they would have the same black 
So you could draw big pictures and it didn't mean, you could use the thin, the thin, really, really thin nibs for detail and thicker nibs for kind of filling in. And when you looked at it at the end, it was all completely the same black. You didn't have that thing of like different tones of black, which you have with some brands. But um, you get to a stage where, you know, they've obviously, you know, Molotow or Montana or um, Faber-Castell or Stabilo, they've, um, they've all got, competent good materials and um, it, it's just a case of finding whatever it is you want to draw on and then trying to use their things on there and seeing what works. Besides client work do you do anything more art related like do you do some exhibitions or uh, uh, that's what I'm hoping, yeah that, that's what I'm hoping to get to now I think is um, I've now got um, I've now got years of work of, of, of piles and piles of piles of work that um, that I've never sort of seen, that I draw on and pack away, I draw on and pack away. And certainly at the start, I would turn down offers of selling things because I was like, well, it, it's probably more interesting to keep it so it makes a story at the end. So I've got hundreds and hundreds of things now. And, um, and at some point, it, yeah, it'd be nice to get those into an exhibition, be nice to get those into an installation, into a show. Well, over the last two years um, of COVID and lockdowns, um, it's been really interesting following a more pure art pattern of just generating work and selling that work. And, and I would love to do more of that as well. Uh, what, what do you mean? Like... So, so painting on canvases or painting on like the car bonnets. So rather than, rather than there being a client involved, you just paint something, somebody likes it, you sell it. So it, it's, um, yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. And that's a, that's a journey I'd like to sort of follow up now. What about, a, what about a book? I'd love to, I would absolutely love to. And when the right person comes along, I'm sort of, I'm in no rush to do these things. So I'm sort of, I'm, I'm fortunate that I can just keep creating work and keep creating work and keep creating work. And when the right person comes along, the right opportunity comes along, then absolutely, I, I would love to put it all into a book now. I've been, there's quite a few books that fortunately have done like features on me, but it would be really nice to be able to put the whole story into there and sort of, as I say, to show work and you can see uh, going back to the same thing, and showing progression within that thing over time. Um, you know, certainly with things like the coffee cups and seeing how they, how they sort of developed over time and how the more I did, the more I was able to, uh, experiment with, with, with them further, get more letters in there, more embellishing, more detail, gold leaf, things like that. So it, it, when you look at back over it, you can definitely see there's a progression and um, it'd be really, yeah, it'd be really great to get that into a book at some point. Yeah, I, I love that. <laughs> That'd be super nice. Yeah. Are there any calligraphy lettering, sign painting artists that uh, you love their work and that you're following them with interest? Uh, not, none that spring to mind because I try and, as I say, I try, I try very much to do my own thing. I don't, I, in the nicest possible way, I don't, re I don't really want to be influenced by anybody else. I, don't, I try to do my own thing. I'm trying not to, I don't want to see something that influences me in, in, you know, within my field. You know, I, I love looking at art and I love looking at artists' work and everything, but, but within lettering, I'm tr just trying to do my own thing as much as I possibly can. Wait, I'm, I'm confused. So you, you're not following any lettering and calligraphy artists? I follow some, yeah, I, I do follow some. I've met, you know met some over time and made but friends. I, I, I didn't mean I didn't mean like following that uh, you get inspired from them and get ideas, but just people which okay, this guy does an amazing job. Like I love his calligraphy or I love his lettering. Well, one um, would have to be Seb Lester. Okay. Yeah. Seb Lester. Seb, yeah. So 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 Seb, yeah, Seb is um Seb's one of my closest friends and um, yeah, and um, yeah, I love his work. I love his, you know, he's, um, yeah, he's a great guy. He's a friend of yours? Yes, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm tempted to, can, I, can you help me to get him on the podcast? <laughs> we, um, we met in, um, oh, crikey, probably about 1995. Wow. So, so we know each other from before lettering. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So well, it's, yeah, it's really strange that we, we our both our journeys and kind of how they've kind of woven together. But yeah, we, yeah, we, we, I've known him for, yeah, probably maybe over 25 years now. 
Okay. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, I really, I will really, really will appreciate if you can give him a word. Of course, I will contact him officially, but you know, it's a, like, I love to have a lot, like such a huge and influencing people on the podcast just to share their story, you know? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, is, is, is there like a, an advice or something that you learned throughout your journey that helped you a lot and that uh, you can just share it with people that, Maybe that yeah, will help them. I think keep on. I think keep on. I think it is tough. It, it, it is it is tough. It's a tough industry. It's tough. Um, but any industry is tough, isn't it? And you know, you know doing anything's tough. It, it's um, but just keep on and keep on and try and find your voice and try and find what it is you want to do and try and sort of play within ideas of what you want to do. Um, if you want to be an artist try and follow that but if you want to be commercial think about how your work could be applied to come up kind of commercial ways so just but just keep creating things keep creating things and, and and see where that takes you um as i say at the very least you'll have you will end up with a body of work whatever that is and however that looks and um and you'll always find that um, creating something is, is a much better way of, 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 uh, of trying to sort of learn what your voice is and where you want to go with it. What's the best thing uh, from the things you do? Like, is it satisfaction? Is it needs to do it? Like, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's um, it's a combination of things, and and that changes. That can change from that can change from 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 the hour to the day. That can be. Um, it can give me confidence. It can give me, um, it, at times, certainly at times in the past, it's it's helped me with low self-esteem. Um, it's um, it gives you reassurance. You know, it, it it can do all these different things for you at any one time. At any one time, um, it can motivate me. Um, it gives you an identity. It's it can be absolutely anything you you want it to be. And as I say, sometimes it will get you through a really tough day. Some days it will make your days really tough, but it's just about kind of keeping on. Where do you get your inspiration? Of course, you're not looking at calligraphy lettering art, but where do you get your inspiration to do works? I just constantly write things down. I just can't, I constantly draw down ideas. I've got, you know, the list of things I need to paint on. And what happens is I get to, I'll, I'll paint on something or I'll create a piece of work and at the end of it, I'm sort of, I'm already thinking about how I can then take that a bit further on the next time. And it just, it, it, it just ends up something, I enjoy it so much. I enjoy the challenge of it so much that, I, that, yeah, as I say, by the time I've got to the end of a piece of work, I'm almost past that now. I can, you know, and I've got three more ideas for three more pieces. And then that just, it just goes from there and there and there. What's the biggest time you spent on, uh, on a piece? Oh, crikey. Um, wow. Uh, what personal work or client work? I don't know. Both. <laughs> uh, well, personal work is probably probably some of the some of the big stuff, some of the big mural work that can take, like, you know, obviously can take a week or two to do. Mm -hmm. um, client work's a lot different. Client work can take months and months and months because, of course, what happens is it goes to you start off with. Well, generally speaking, when a client comes along, you start off. You go back to the client with sort of three or four different approaches. And then obviously that goes to then a committee of people, whether that's one person making that decision or 20 people making that decision, they come back to you with what kind of three different directions. You go back to them and, and that, that process can take, that can take weeks, it can take months. Um, it can take years um, on, some, on some stuff you do. It can take such a long time because you're sort of refining and refining and refining. So um, yeah, client work can take, can take uh, years. Um, personal work can, can certainly take weeks. Or uh, there are ideas that I sort of abandon and then go back to like months and months later where I just, and sometimes you do things and you just cannot make them work. You cannot make them work at all. So you just think, right, no, I leave that, I'll put that to one side. And then in weeks later, you think, right, okay, I've got a free day now, or I've, I've figured out a different way of doing something. So I'll go back to it and do it all over again. I think you're not going to answer my, my question, but <laughs> like, we don't include the client work. Is there 
a piece of work of your that that's your favorite one like you love it the most or or you're like these people that say oh my work is like my child so no I, yeah i don't i don't know it's probably the piece of work i'm working on at that very moment to be honest I, as i say what happens is that that piece of work at the moment i'm really enjoying I've, i i started this project um maybe be, what would it be probably six months ago now called sketchbook athletics where I was like what what can I do to put as much as I possibly can into every single spread of my sketchbook I could really really want to put as much as as I possibly can and, and that's become this a real favorite thing of mine at the moment I love doing it I love again every letter you choose you sort of like you, you're trying to sort of um they're trying to keep a thread that that follows through the whole book but at the same point in time you're, tr you, you're trying to better each letter each time and this so is, that that's this is the, the project that where you write like a a a a on yeah, yeah yes yeah. yeah. so if i've got like just bear with me so yeah so so like um so like yeah so so you basically you just you, you choose a letter i'm going through the alphabet one by one by one I've, I've only got a few left to do now but that's become my favorite thing of just you know it's um i've just You've got that, you've got literally an A4 page and it's just, what what can you possibly get into that A4 page? The videos are like just a few seconds, but for example, this S, yeah. two, two pages, how much time you spend to create uh, it? That's probably, maybe, probably about five, about five hours, maybe. Wow. wow. Yeah, about five hours, but you, you have breaks and everything within that, you know. You I know, stop, but yeah, I've spoken with, a, with a lot of people about this, like, I love lettering. I, I enjoy watching it and everything. But even, even though I want to do it, but this is, it, it just takes so much time. Like uh, it requires a lot of time. It, yeah, but I think um, the key is obviously always to make sure you enjoy it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I enjoy like I love watching it. But like even with calligraphy, when I do stuff, it takes time. But I'm writing, you know, and it's not as slow as lettering. And I know lettering arts and just looking to the work, I know there is so much time you spent in it. And to be honest, a lot of the time, a lot of the time, and certainly with these pieces, um, a lot of the work I do, a lot of the time is spent beforehand. A lot of the time is spent in your head beforehand, working out how to do it the best way possible. So it's kind of, by the time I, by the time I start drawing, I, I've sort of, I, I roughly know what, how long it will take me because I've roughly, I've worked out exactly how it's going to look. Oh. So I can see, generally speaking, I can sort of see the end, the end result. And so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I know where I am within that journey. Is this the whole sketchbook? Is it going to be only alphabet? Because I guess it's more than 26 pages. Uh, yes, well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, we'll see. When I get to the very last letter, we'll see. Maybe I'll get towards numbers then, or I don't know. I don't know. I, I haven't thought that far ahead, to be honest. It's become, as I say, it's become this, um, it's become such a, such a huge, um, such a huge undertaking. That, um, I love it. I love it. It's, it's such a beauty, like, uh, yeah. oh it, my God. It, you just, you just keep going back into it and going back into it and going back into it. So, Again, that would be something that I would, um, at some point, it'd be great to publish that, it'd be great to get that out there. Um, who knows? Um, but, but yeah, that, that's become my sort of favorite thing that I do at the moment. Is there something that uh, I haven't asked you, but you wanted to speak about? I don't think so, no, I don't think so. But if there is, just call me back. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, and... Uh... We can, have a, we can have we can have a sort of uh, a second session of course no i mean if, if you're up for it like i can invite you also to i have another podcast it's it's me and paul antonio it's me and him speaking and it's it's a shorter format from this one yeah and yeah that'd be great to have you there as well i mean yeah, it's yeah, absolutely awesome absolutely. Okay, yeah then. yeah I, but no i think i think that's pretty much me um yeah and my work Okay, I, I have one more question. Is there something that, besides lettering, that gives you satisfaction and that you like to do something like a hobby or your life is only lettering? Uh, no, well, I've got my son, I've got my, you know, got a, I've got a wonderful dog, I've got my partner, my family. Um, uh, but I love, I, I love art. I love art. I always have done. 
Um, it's great to be able to do something that you love as a job, if that makes sense. Um, yes, yes, of course. And, and it takes a lot of it takes a lot of my time, but it's not um, it's not something that it's that, that's a problem. You know, I, I enjoy the amount of time it takes. Mm -hmm. It can be frustrating. It can be difficult, but it's at the same point in time. I, I sort of um, I learned, you know, to be serious for a second. I learned I learned when I lost my job that um, nobody was going to do it for you. Um, you, you sort of, you, you can rely on other people and you can rely on other people, you can rely on other people. And, and you know, you sort of realize that actually the best person to rely on is yourself. You know, nobody, nobody will do it for, well, I felt that like nobody would do it for me. So I felt like I'm the only person, certainly early on, who can sort of drive this along and move this along. So, so for me, very much, it's kind of like, um, yeah, make sure you're passionate about it because it's going to take a while. Wow. It gave me goosebumps because I was about to ask you to say something for the end of the episode, but this was perfect ending. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. Cool. This is, yeah. It's really nice. I, I loved it. <laughs> so, Rob, uh, I'm super happy I'm, to, that I had you on the podcast. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your story. No, no, with thank me you. And thank the you. audience. Thank you and, so much for asking me. I, I, I say, I hope. Um, as is always the case with these things, um, I don't think you ever listen, you never necessarily listen to, want to listen to somebody else's story, it's the take homes for yourself. So I hope there's something that people can kind of take home and apply to themselves and kind of take their own journey forward. Well, that's the, the point of the whole podcast, but yeah. uh, if you have something upcoming or if you want to promote something, feel free, or um, if I you're think... selling something, I can put links, whatever. Yeah, um, maybe in time I will. Um, I'm talking, I'm in Barcelona talking at off, maybe, is it next week, I think? Mm -hmm. Next week, yeah, so well, that'd be great. But yeah, but yeah, I can send you some links and things like that. That's cool. Sure, sure. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And as always, keep writing. Thank you so much. Okay, well, okay this was great. Uh, I really appreciate your time, uh, Rob. It was uh, super nice to learn about your story.